Okay, great. Good morning and welcome to Vermont House Judiciary Committee. And this morning we are going to be looking at H87, which is an act relating to establishing a classification system for criminal offenses. Um, I'm Maxine Grad, chair of the committee. And uh, this morning I'm gonna turn it over to Representative Martin Lalonde to do a walkthrough. Generally, we do have legislative council uh, doing a walkthrough, but there often are times where legislative council is needed elsewhere. And as Representative Lalonde will tell you, this is a, um, a bill that, uh, that went through this committee, passed the House, and uh, because of um, the pandemic, the Senate was not able to get to it. So. Representative Lalonde is very familiar with it. And so it's um, so it's great that he is available to do the, the walkthrough in the absence of a uh, council. So I'm gonna turn it over to you, Martin. Thanks so much. Thank you, thank you. This won't be uh, as smooth, I'm sure, as, uh, as Eric uh, would be. I'll do my best. Uh, I, I will ask I, um, whether folks have this, if they prefer for me to have it uh, shared screen, so because I'm going to be kind of bouncing around on the bill a little bit, or if they just want me to point to pages, what's the preference, uh, Bob, Felicia, Kate? Because I'm having it up on my screen, so I'm probably going to be following that along better than on the screen, but that's just my preference. Okay, yeah, Bob. I have it on my screen also, Martin. And Kate, do you want me to, uh, you're on your phone, so you probably can't see it very well anyway. So I'm pulling it up on my phone. So that's part of the reason I have to have my, vid my video off. So, so I can look at it on my phone as you're talking, I okay. guess. All right. So, so, so it I, works for me if you don't share. All right. I won't do the share screen. And if uh, some folks uh, are watching this out in YouTube world or going to watch it, they can get, a, get the uh, bill uh, on the uh, committee page. Uh, or just uh, it's H87. Uh, so, so all right. So we'll do it this way. Um, I'm going to give a little bit background first, and and then we'll get into the language of the bill. Uh, this has been an issue that's been going on for quite some time, uh, trying to restructure the criminal code uh, for for a number of reasons. Uh, but really, uh, there was a recognition back in 2013 that Vermont needed to modernize and simplify its criminal code, which led to uh, Act 61. And that law created a criminal code reclassification working group to review all of Vermont's criminal penalties, as well as to look at other states' sentencing structures. And the working group was tasked with recommending a sentencing structure that allows for sentencing consistent with the gravity of the offense and the culpability of the offender. So in 2015, the working group recommended a five-tier classification system for felonies and misdemeanors with a maximum term of imprisonment and a maximum fine for each tier. Uh, that particular report, I've had uh, Mike Bailey load up onto our, our site, so you'll be able to see that if you want to look at the website. Uh, you know, you don't have to necessarily look at it right now, but but that is has been uh, uploaded. So, after some initial initial work, uh, it was determined that implementing this recommendation it was going to require a substantial amount of analysis by all the stakeholders in the criminal justice area. And uh, since the sentencing commission already existed, uh, though it hadn't really been meeting for a while. Uh, there was a body already there that could, that included all the relevant stakeholders. So in 2018, uh, under Act 142, the legislature appropriated a small sum for the commission to be reconstituted uh, to examine the classification issue. Uh, it also tasked the commission with making recommendations for which offense should be placed in which categories of the system. So the Sentencing Commission includes prosecutors, defense attorneys, judges, law enforcement, legislators, and other stakeholders. ACLU has a person who is sitting in on it as well. And the purpose of the Commission's work was to establish a, a rational criminal code using Vermont's current 
code as a starting point. And, and the idea, and there's some re reasons to have uh, a restructured criminal code. You know, a clearer, more rational code would provide for more consistent interpretations of our criminal offenses, better notice to citizens and law enforcement as to what conduct is prohibited, uh, greater proportionality between offenses and punishment, and greater uniformity in sentences throughout Vermont. Uh, so the end goal is to create a more consistent and understandable code to improve our criminal justice system. And, and we'll have witnesses in who will explain this a little bit further, but I do want to just highlight something we heard last year from uh, one of our witnesses on this, and that was uh, the attorney for the Defender General's Office, uh, Marshall Paul. Uh, he testified uh, last year, and we'll probably have him in again, that the Vermont's criminal code is more difficult to, uh, for criminal defendants to understand uh, than the criminal codes of other states that have adopted a classification system. Uh, he also testified that current criminal code, that our cur current criminal code leads to inconsistency across the state and between sentences for similar conduct, and that the current complexity and inconsistency in Vermont's current criminal laws causes Vermonters to mistrust the criminal justice system. So last year, we really started the process with what was then H580, which is now H87, uh, of simplifying the Vermont's uh, criminal laws. Excuse uh, me, Martin, before you get to that, um, that Ken has his hand up. Is anybody else losing Martin a lot, like for probably two minutes there for a span? Nope, nope. Okay, thanks. Sure, Ken, if you need to turn your uh, turn your video off, some, that might help if it's if it's on your end. Yeah, I did. It didn't work, but I'm go I'm I'm going off. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Martin. Oh, no problem. Um, so, yeah, to reach reach our goal uh, of having this rational, consistent, simplified criminal code. Uh, H580 and now H87 establishes a structure uh, for that code or the classification system, we can call it. And, and based on the, the, uh, that was based on the commission's recommendation. And it also starts to place criminal offenses into their appropriate classes. And we're starting by focusing on property crimes based on the commission's recommendation. So this is work that's ongoing. And since, uh, since Actually, we decided to just proceed with one area of the criminal code, and that was property crimes. Uh, we had a recommendation, and, and it's awaiting us still, uh, dealing with sex crimes. And since, uh, since this bill, since last year, uh, the uh, Sentencing Commission has come out with additional recommendations uh, related to classification of crimes against persons. And they are currently working on classification recommendations for drug crimes uh, and motor vehicle offenses. So those things are coming. But the idea behind this bill is to set up the system and, and move the ball uh, essentially towards uh, the end goal of having this restructured criminal code. So I'm gonna turn to the bill's language now and kind of walk through what it is. But let me just also point out that on the uh, website, in addition to uh, uploading the report from 2015, uh, you can find the commission's report, Sentencing Commission's November 2019 report uh, is with, on which this is based, this bill is based. Uh, there are a number of other factors or are, are issues that the Sentencing Commission looked into that are not really relevant for this bill at this time, but uh, I, did, I did have that uh, put onto our website. So looking at the bill, H, H87. So the first section, section one, uh, it sets up the classification system for criminal offenses. There are five felony level offenses uh, uh, from class A that carries a maximum sentence of life imprisonment and a maximum fine of $500,000 to class E, which carries a maximum term of imprisonment of three years 
and maximum fine of $15,000. So you can see, that, and that's really on page two where it sets forth uh, the various sentences for the various classes. Uh, so it also had uh, the committee, well, let me first explain that the committee made a couple of different change, a couple of changes from the recommendation uh, of the sentencing commission. The commission recommended that a class B felony should carry a sentence of 25 years, uh, but the, we, we changed that, uh, this bill changes that uh, to 20 years. And, and the primary reason for that was just how the crimes fit. Uh, if we had a 25 year, we had some kind of outlier crimes uh, uh, that really didn't fit in. And, and this is something we can get into further down the road if, if necessary. It just made more sense that 20 years would be the class B uh, level. Uh, so the committee also reduced uh, the maximum fines that uh, the sentencing commission had recommended. Uh, one of the things we learned through, uh, well, one of the things that sentencing commission also saw, but we also learned through uh, testimony last year is that courts seldom uh, impose anything near the maximum uh, fines that, that we had listed before and frankly what we have even listed right now. The, the Sentencing Commission is doing further work on, on fines and we may see something down the road where we might be changing those fine levels, but uh, that work continues with the Sentencing Commission. So the bill also on page, page two, uh, subsection uh, 52B, uh, sets forth five classes of misdemeanors uh, from a class A misdemeanor with a maximum two-year term of imprisonment and maximum fine of $10,000 to a class E misdemeanor that carries in car in, uh, no incarceration and a $250,000 fine. And with this, the committee made uh, a couple changes to the fines for misdemeanors, and that's found on page three. Are the, are the fines that are associated with those different classes. Uh, we, cut the, we cut in half the fines for the class D and E misdemeanors from the proposal that we received uh, from the Sentencing Commission. Otherwise, we, we stayed pretty true uh, to what the Sentencing Commission had recommended. So section 54, which is in the bottom of page three, uh, that provides a transitional provisions. So when this bill goes into effect, and let me double check what we have as the effect of uh, 2022, uh, the reason, first of all, for that longer uh, uh, effective date, that effective date pushed out, is hopefully we can uh, implement the other recommendations of the Sentencing Commission before this goes into effect. Um, but in any event, if for those, for those offenses, that haven't been specifically classified through a bill such as H87, uh, this transition period or this transition provision, I should say, uh, kind of automatically uh, places uh, crimes that we haven't otherwise explicitly classified, it, it, it puts them into classification. So, so for example, uh, so all felonies punishable by a maximum term of 10 years or more, but less than 20 years would be deemed a class C felony. And that carries a maximum term of imprisonment of 10 years. So if an offense was uh, has a 14 year maximum uh, term of imprisonment, and there are some that do, it would automatically be considered a class C felony uh, with a maximum term of 10 years. So that's essentially how the Section 54 transition provisions uh, work. Um, I could walk through every line there, but I think you get the point with how that would work. And I'm, I'm hoping that that is not going to be very necessary, um, uh, that we will have gone through all the various offenses and have actually made uh, explicit choices of how they should be classified. Excuse me, Martin, before you go on, let's just check in with committee members. Anybody have any questions? I was just curious, Martin, <clears throat> in looking at this, of course, from uh, 
my experience, I think that two years in one day becomes a felony within the state of Vermont. Obviously, that's we're looking at changing this. But if both uh, jail sentence and fines are imposed, and let's say it's up to 20 years and uh, our courts have established a 14 year period for this individual, if they are unable to pay the fine, what happens then? Do they get more added on to their sentence or what's, what's the direction you're heading in there? Uh, no, they, they don't. Uh, uh, if they're unable to pay the fine, that's, um, there are other ways that cor the court courts uh, try to get payment of fines. For instance, um, uh, fines can be, or uh, if there's a tax refund that can be deducted from a tax refund, there's, uh, there's different ways that courts uh, collect fines, whether they're associated with incarceration or not. <clears throat> But they're very separate. The incarceration and the fine are, are, are separate components of, of uh, the consequences of, of being convicted of one of these offenses or having agreed to a plea, plea deal. So an individual not paying a fine that does not lead to additional incarceration, uh, if, that's, if that's the question, if I'm understanding that right. Yes. Thank you. Yep, no problem. So, Section 55. Um, sorry. sorry, Martin. Kate has her, her hand oh, up. All right, Kate. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Hey, sorry. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Um, I don't know if this is the right question for right now, but, but just to understand more clearly, were you saying that you found that courts are not um, giving sentence lengths as long as the maximum sentence very often or or are actually doing it quite rarely is that what you're saying uh so i was i was specifically speaking about fines at that point uh that uh courts really they they fines are not something that is um emphasized as far as consequences uh and and are often you know far lower than uh, the maximum uh, as i'll explain in a little bit when i give an example uh, of how this all works uh, that is the case also with with the incarceration uh, sentences as well, and and in fact this the there this uh, the bill here and other efforts of the sentencing commission actually generally reduces though not in all cases uh, the term of a maximum sentence, and part of the reason for doing that is they're trying to match what's called the so-called going rate. So uh, when I get to it, you know, there's some, there's some uh, crimes that would have a 10 year period, but, but the, no, no court is sentencing even close to the 10 year and, and the so-called going rate, the average for sentence length is around two and a half, three years. So in those kind of situations, uh, we're trying to narrow that box of discretion uh, to more closely reflect what people are actually being sentenced. It's almost somewhat of a truth in sentencing uh, kind of uh, aspect to all this, uh, that we're actually looking at what the sentences are uh, and trying to put the maximum sentences more in line with that. I don't know if that answers Great. the question. Yeah, that was my question. Was, yeah, was, and I'll have, you know, I'll was have that addressed? Specific, I'll have a specific example as, uh, when we get there. And just as a highlight, I'm not planning on going through every page of this 36 page bill because I don't think it's necessary because once you see the pattern, it, it all kind of makes some sense. Um, and Barbara has, a, has her hand up. Yes. Hi, Martin. Um, so I, you may have said this, I was switching from my phone to my iPad and was offered a smidgen. Um, and I can't recall the answer from when we talked about it before. But in addition to trying to put sentences into a system that makes sense, are there discussions about things, if, for example, making some crimes go away or holes where new crimes are needed? I, hate, I hesitate to say that, but... Um, can you remind me about that? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, 
there, we will, there, there is one new crime, which, which because of the way we set up the property offenses has been necessary. And that's retail theft, which I'll, I'll explain in a minute. Right. Okay. Uh, the yeah. other issue is, is not in this bill, uh, but it is, and it's uh, something I, I neglected to mention as far as ongoing work of the Sentencing Commission, uh, is to look at archaic cl crimes, ones that are not being charged, ones that don't make sense to be crimes anymore, uh, and, and decriminalizing, you know, getting them off the books. So that is ongoing work of the, of the commission as well, uh, and uh, making some possible crimes simply civil offenses. So that's another big thing that they've been working on. They just haven't come up uh, with the recommendation yet. And what about minimum, minimum sentences? Did you mention that today? I so I that. didn't mention minimum sentences. Uh, okay. sentences uh, at this point, point they the uh commission hasn't recommended changing minimum sentence certainly in the property crimes i do believe if i'm remembering right uh the recommendations that we're going to see on uh crimes against persons uh, may uh modify that if i uh, but i i may be misremembering one one of the uh, directives of the law that put this in place with the sentencing commission uh states that the commission is not supposed to increase sentences, sentences unless it's really called for, unless it's just to make this whole thing make sense and not to have any uh, minimum sentences. Okay. Uh, that was a directive, you know, for if there's gonna be changes, don't put in new minimum sentences. And are you able to do away with any minimum sentences? Well, that's the part I, I just don't recall. I, I seem to recall. Okay that we may have done so with personal crimes. I don't believe there are minimum sentences in the, in the property offenses. So I also just had Mike send out to everyone that PowerPoint from the NCSL workshop. And I'm wondering if the commission would be open to us um, sending or working with uh, Recid, I, I can't remember the name, Recida Co or something to um, model out what some of the recommendations are. Yeah, I don't know. I haven't had a chance to look at that yet. Okay, all right, thank you. I know that the Council of State Governments who have been doing the justice reinvestment have been following what's going on with the Sentencing Commission. I know it's a different outfit, but we do have yeah. some outside expertise uh, who, have, who have been following this. Thank you. So um, on page five of the bill, uh, there's uh, section 55, classification of property offenses. Uh, and, and this is a fairly significant, though um, very good change that, that pretty much everybody agreed to the, the concept uh, in the Sentencing Commission. So currently, uh, the sentence for many of the Vermont's property crimes depends on the value of property. Not all of them, but many of them do. And generally, as the law stands right now, if the value of the property stolen uh, or damaged is less than $900, and again, it's not all the property crimes, but it's a good deal, good number of them, then the offense is a misdemeanor. Uh, if it's over $900, uh, it becomes a felony. So the commission though recommended a tiered system of sentencing depending on the value of the property involved in the crime. And there are other states that do this as well. So in making the recommendation, the commission was not really breaking new ground because again, other states have, have followed this. Um, so we followed the commission's recommendation but we modified the proposed tiers slightly from what the recommendation is. Uh, the key difference between the commission's recommendation uh, and this bill uh, relates to what is referred to as the felony threshold. So as I mentioned before, under current law, the felony threshold for many property crimes is $900. If you steal over $900, you're facing a felony. If under $900, it's a misdemeanor. The commission suggested that the felony threshold should be $10,000. Uh, the commission felt that moving from $900 or the committee felt that last year, uh, and this is uh, 
the one issue that we really went back and forth with a, a lot and really gave a lot of consideration and heard different viewpoints from witnesses. Uh, but ultimately, we decided that moving from $900 to $10,000 was too large of a leap. Um, and also that a felony threshold of $10,000 would be far above what other states have set. So, the, so we agreed last year, and, and it's what's reflected now in this bill, it's what passed out of the house. Um, we reduced the threshold to $3,000 to be more in line with other states. And, and I can make some comments about that uh, later if, if, uh, if necessary. Um, so in addition to that, the committee changed the maximum terms of imprisonment for offenses involving values exceeding the felony threshold. So the commission recommended that felony offenses be categorized as class D felonies, uh, which carry a maximum term of imprisonment of five years, uh, and class C felonies, which carry a maximum term of imprisonment of 10 years. But this bill uh, in the committee last year uh, decided that it was more appropriate for felony offenses, property crimes, to be charged as class E felonies, carrying a maximum term of imprisonment of three years, or class D felonies, carrying a maximum term of imprisonment of five years. So uh, there shouldn't be any of the 10-year uh, felonies uh, for property crimes. So that was the other big change from what the commission uh, recommended. But in the end, you know, there are there, there are part, you know, we had testimony from a lot of commission members, you know, the, and there were different, there were some disagreements uh, in the commission, uh, but, and there were disagreements in the, in the testimony that we received, but, but overall there, there was support, broad support uh, for the overall concept and what we were doing. Uh, and I know that there wasn't any objection to, to these well, there was an objection uh, that some folks wanted to stay at 10,000 for the felony level. Uh, but as far as change, the change I just mentioned to uh, being a class E and class D felony instead of a class C, I'm sorry, yeah, class D and class C felony uh, received support from everybody. So, so I'm gonna go over how this tiered system works and, and how we have justified using the maximum terms of imprisonment of three or five years for felonies. And the best way to do this is I'm gonna do an example. So I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna skip over the attempts section two, the section nine attempts just for now so, we can, so I can make sure I've explained how this whole tiered system works including with the class classes. So I'm gonna have you jump ahead if you could, if you're following along to page 11, because it's just the one I'm gonna use as an example of uh, false pretenses or tokens. So currently the maximum term of imprisonment for false pretenses is one year if the value of the property is less than $900. But if the value of the property is over $900, the maximum term jumps up to 10 years. So the bill replaces that structure and you can see at the bottom of page 11, it replaces that structure so, so that it is more gradual. It provides that the sentence will depend on the value tiers and classification system that is found in sections 52, 53, and 55, which we went over a moment ago, but I'll jump back and forth in a second. Um, under the bill, if the value involved is a false pretense charge is over 3,000, but less than 100,000, you know, one can look at the property cla offense classification on page five. And you can see if the value of the property, it's on subsection, let me see, I'm trying to make sure I'm following my notes right. Subsection four, uh, if the property, if the value of the property is at issue in the offense is less than $100,000 and equal to or greater than $3,000, uh, the offense shall be a class E felony. So you can jump back to the second page and you can see that a class E felony uh, has imprisonment for three years. Uh, page three, a class E felony has a maximum fine of $15,000. So that's, 
kind of generally how the how these sections work together. Um, so if it's over $100,000, it would be a class D felony uh, with the maximum term of imprisonment of five years. Once again, you can see on page five, uh, subsection five, 50, section 55, subsection five uh, explains that it would be a class D felony. And one can look at page two and three and see what that, that uh, would be a uh, maximum term of imprisonment of five years maximum fine of $25,000. So that's how that generally works through most of these, uh, most of these uh, property offenses that are through, uh, through this bill. But so, so the committee looked though at actual sentences last year, and this is information that I don't recall if I've uploaded that document. If I haven't, I will uh, have Mike upload that document. Uh, but we worked with the crime research group, which is able to provide a lot of information about what over the last 10 years have, has been charged, what the sentences have been, what the average sentence, that data is available and was very helpful. So, so for false pretenses, what we learned from looking at the data provided from CRG, the crime research group, is that the average minimum term of incarceration for a felony level false pretense offense was 1.1 years. Uh, the average maximum term was 3.6 years. And again, that doesn't mean there's an automatic minimum. That's not what that's saying at all, but that just happens to be what the average minimum, average maximum was. So the offenders were simply not being sentenced to anything close to the 10 year maximum term. Uh, and this so-called going rate for sentences for false pretense felonies is between one and 3.6 years. So the penalty structure that we set up uh, in uh, H87 is in line with the going rate for the false pretense offense and other property offenses in the bill. And this is something that uh, the Sentencing Commission looked at as well. Uh, it is something that uh, was presented to us by various uh, witnesses as well. So, um, and I, I know we did hear last year from the Department of State's attorneys uh, who testified that for these property crimes, offenders generally are not being sentenced to the maximum terms allowed. And, and they supported this new structure, including a felony with a maximum uh, five-year term of imprisonment. So a number of the uh, property offenses addressed in H580 we're not really susceptible to this tiered uh, system. And I will give you a couple examples here and, and one can, can walk through and I'm happy to walk through every one, but I just don't think it's probably necessary. Uh, but, so, but for instance, the offense of identity theft, and that's found at page, page 13 of the bill, uh, that's classified as a class E felony for a first offense and a class C felony for a second offense. Uh, it, it does not use the tiered property value for purposes of determining the sentence. It's, and simply put, it wouldn't, it would be difficult to put a value on what is taken when one's identity is stolen. So we try to, to follow fairly closely to what the current uh, 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 punishment or current incarceration uh, for that offense was. So that's why we said uh, class E offense, uh, which matches the three year, the current uh, term of three years. And we, uh, for the second offense, we matched the 10 year term by saying that that would be a class C felony. Um, but I, so I, I, I'm happy to go through every one, but I don't know that we need to. I can say essentially that, you know, sections, three through 21 of this bill and sections 23 through 50 of the bill modify the penalty provisions of Vermont's property crimes by either following the tiered system uh, that I mentioned or that we've gone over or classifying the offense as a class C, D or E felony uh, consistent with what it currently is uh, charged or a class A, B, C, D, or E misdemeanor. Um, but I am gonna turn your attention to, to 
section 22 of the bill, which is at page 18. Actually, Martin, before you do that, let me, let's just check in with folks. A lot of information here. <laughs> Questions? No. Okay. Uh, oops, I, uh, Kate. Kate has a question. Yeah, I have a lot of questions that are coming up, but again, I don't know if they're best addressed right now or not. Um, some of them include like, and I apologize if you said this already, um, whether there are uh, acts that were moved out of felony and into misdemeanor, uh, out of felony altogether. Um, and what was the other question that I had? I guess the other question that I have is more sort of whether you guys can point me in the direction of resources that help me understand what else is included um, when something is classified as a felony, it impacts people in ways outside of just the fine they have to pay and the length of sentence that they have to serve. And I was curious, um, again, if you could point me in a direction of resources that could sort of explain that a little bit more of what people have to go through when they fall into one over the other. Yeah, no, that's, that's a critical point. Uh, and that, that is a, a major underlying reason for uh, increasing the so-called felony level. Um, what, what we are, have understood from testimony and, and we can certainly, this is questions that you wanna ask uh, uh, state's attorneys, AG, uh, defenders, others, um, but the fact that just over $900, um, and, and we did get some information, I'll have to try to track it down, where it, it um, tried to explain and unfortunately, the information is not is not great. It's just not really uh, comprehensive. But try to look at well, how many how many crimes are over nine hundred dollars and under three thousand dollars or under ten thousand dollars is one of the things we're looking at. How many crimes fall into that uh, scope that would be a felony? And, and how many crimes or how many offenses are we now changing that would be a misdemeanor instead of a felony by moving up to $3,000 as the threshold or $10,000. So we, we've, from what I, I'm recalling, uh, we, by moving up to 3,000, we were making some, uh, some significant uh, inroads on reducing the number of felonies for property crimes. And, the rationale, the reason for that is a felony has much longer term negative consequences for an individual um, you know, as far as housing, as far, I mean, it, it's a criminal record having a felony on the criminal record rather than a misdemeanor, uh, you know, it has consequences. Uh, also, uh, I think our, our expungement laws that we've been continuing to work on uh, at some point, presumably, most property crimes, if they're not already, I think they may already be expungible, uh, the property crimes are nonviolent property crimes. Uh, so allowing somebody to get that off the record is also something that deals with those collateral, so-called collateral consequences of, of having a criminal record, particularly uh, a felony record. Uh, but yeah, I'm sure that I don't have uh, sources off hand, uh, but I'm sure that Marshall Paul, uh, uh, James Pepper, David Shear would all be able to point to, to studies. Uh, probably uh, Representative Rachelson probably can point us to studies as well as far as the, the downside of having a felony versus a misdemeanor. So yeah, bottom line is that this, this particular bill and actually other recommendations coming from the Sentencing Commission uh, will reduce the number of felonies that are being charged uh, and, and, and have more moved to misdemeanor uh, type crimes uh, where there are presumably somewhat less collateral consequences. I don't know if that answered your question, but it's a big, it's a big question. It's a, it's a, it's a primary motivating uh, rationale for what we're trying to do with the criminal code as well. Thank you. So. All right, so we did, uh, 
on page 18, and unless there's another question, I'll move ahead. All right, so page 18 uh, in section 22, uh, it creates a new crime of organized retail theft. And this new crime is included due to a concern that was raised in the committee last year, that there are groups of individuals acting in concert uh, who shoplift from stores and sell the goods on the black market. These individuals take particular care that they're not exceeding the value of goods such that they may face a felony if caught. Uh, so the new offense of organized retail theft would allow law enforcement to aggregate the total value of stolen goods over a period of time to determine the appropriate sentencing level. Uh, and the committee last year uh, determined that the appropriate, you know, uh, that it was important to add this new offense uh, to provide law enforcement with an additional tool uh, to address this activity. And, and also, you know, to address some, <clears throat> some input that we shouldn't move to a $3,000 felony level uh, it, because of this kind of situation. But this addresses that situation where you can accumulate the value. So I'm going to turn back to one bit that I jumped over and then we'll be happy to take other questions. And that is the attempt language. Uh, and that's on page five. It's section two uh, and it's uh, subsection, it's nine. And, and what, what that section is doing is uh, simply aligning, it's fairly straightforward, but it aligns Vermont's attempt law with the new classification scheme. Uh, I think it's, uh, I believe it's self-explanatory, but that, that's the purpose of that particular section. So I think that's all I have at the moment. I'm, I'm happy to hit on a couple other issues, but they're um, as far as, you know, the felony threshold, if anybody wants to hear more about the felony threshold or if we should uh, postpone that uh, when we, hear from other folks. Committee? Yeah. Uh, Tom and then Selena. Thank you. Uh, Martin, uh, section two under the attempts. Um, what's coming to mind is, I, I don't know if you remember the, the uh, young man in Fairhaven uh, that made threats towards the high school. If you, if you remember that at all. So I'm just wondering if if uh, if that under this language, would that be considered an attempt uh, just because he, I mean, he had it in a, uh, what some people call the manifesto, uh, uh, but he had it written down his plans, uh, uh, you know, what he allegedly, uh, uh, you know, intended to do. And I'm just wondering if that, if, if this uh, section nine attempts would would address that? Uh, no, it do, it doesn't change the current law as far as the attempts. It just changes what the subsequent punishment would be. I mean, if, as you recall, we we did look kind of deeply at. Uh, I think there was even a bill. Uh, I think it even may have been a bill I sponsored that that changed uh, attempt law uh, to track what some other states do, uh, looking at uh, behavior earlier in a process or earlier in a, where, where somebody is planning a crime, uh, our current attempt law has you know, essentially provides that you have to be pretty darn close to committing that crime temporally and physically. And we were trying to change that. This does not change that. And, and right. in fact, that, that bill, we never did pass out of uh, committee uh, if I'm recalling right. Right, um, yeah, I think, I'm mix, I think I'm mixing both of them together in my head. Yeah, no, that was separate, yeah, that was a separate one. This this that really doesn't change how the temp law is applied. Just just what the punishment or the incarceration period is. Great, thank you. Okay, uh, Selena and then Barbara. Um, I have a question that's about sort of the just the <clears throat> an overall strategy around the bill, and I don't know if now it feels like the right time to ask that or not you're are you done you're done with your bill presentation right martin 
yeah, I, I, I can add some, if there's questions about the felony threshold, I can explain that a little bit. This is not a question about the felony threshold. Should I just hold it? No, I could, go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, my sound is a little wonky this morning, but I, my question, I know, I mean, I just want to say for the record, I'm pretty agnostic on this, but we're kind of doing two things in this bill, right? One is we're really going crime by crime in the property crimes and revising the associated penalties and mapping them um, as best we can to the new schema. But the others were sort of like saying, okay, this is going to be the new schema and really setting it forward. Um, and I know last biennium, at one point, those were two separate bills that got kind of brought together. And that one of the things we heard a little bit of pushback on at times or just questions about including from our, from our counterparts in the other chamber, I think, was that question of like, do we really need to move the whole new schema forward now? Is that putting the cart a little bit before the horse? You know, if we're not actually going through the reclassification for the whole um, criminal, all the all this all the crimes on the books, and I just wonder what your response to that, Martin, is as we move forward with this work. Like, why why do we need the framework? Why is the framework important, and why is it important to move that forward now? Well, well that's a great. That's a great question. Uh, and, and that's one that we've pondered a lot and kicked around as far as what's the best uh, strategy or tactics for actually putting this into place. And uh, I know in past legislatures, and I think this may have been even before Chair Grad was on the committee, maybe it was during your time when uh, Betty Nuovo was the uh, chair. Uh, she she tried they back then tried to take on the whole restructuring and it collapsed under its weight i believe uh is kind of how i've understood it but so so i think that the idea was to take these take this in kind of bite-sized pieces so to speak uh so that it's not overwhelming uh i mean i think to go through 847 plus offenses all at once, as opposed to dividing them up into property crimes, crimes against persons, sex crimes, drug crimes, etc. cetera. Um, I think that it's manageable. It's more manageable. Um, so that, I mean, that's, that's, I think, and that's how the sentencing commission has been approaching this as well. And, and I think we've looked ahead enough to, the Sentencing Commission has looked ahead enough to see that this is going to work for those other crimes, but there are going to be decisions. And the tougher ones are, frankly, so far that I've seen are, are in the crimes against persons, which is a recommendation that came out this past uh, fall, that there, there are essentially a couple different recommendations. There, there was more disagreement of where to go with that one than with property crimes and sex crimes and others. Uh, so I think it just makes sense to, we could really, uh, well, for, you know, another reason is I think that this allows us to really dig into the particular area of property crimes. If we had 800 crimes, I don't think we'd be able to dig in as much as we've been able to dig in by taking it bit by bit. So it, it has been kind of a, but we have kicked around. We also kicked around even for this session. Well, should we expand what we did on H580, expand it to the other recommendations that we have? Or should we try to, since we've gone over this path once already, should we try to get H87 out as, as soon as possible to get it over to the Senate for them to start considering this? Uh, and I think ultimately that's where we landed just because we're in this remote world. And I think it'd be harder for us to take up some of these other recommendations uh, in the time that we have allotted, really. Does that make sense? It does. I just, I just really wanted to hear your rationale. And I found the thing that you said that I found particularly helpful in, in sort of support of this approach is that the, 
enough work has really been done. And it sounds like even since last session, more work has been done to start to map more and more of the crimes to this schema so that we know, like, yes, there's some soundness to this. It, it really does work because I think that's the fear, right? That I've heard from some folks is like, if we haven't done all the crimes, how do we know we got the schema right? But it sounds like there's enough work coming out of the sentencing commission that we've, we've kind of had ample opportunity to, to test the framework. Well, and I would add, add that, that the recently with the um, crimes against persons. So we, we identified a while ago that there are some areas that were gonna to be tougher to fit into this scheme. Uh, into this classification. And I'll, I'll use an example of uh, 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 burglary of an occupied dwelling. And the way that burglary with an occupied dwelling uh, works is there's different uh, tiers even within that. Um, well, there's burglary. There's burglary of an occupied dwelling. There's burglary of an occupied dwelling when the uh, offender has a weapon. And, and these all have different times that didn't quite fit into the structure, but the sentencing commission, that's not one of the areas of disagreement, if I'm recalling right, uh, for the crimes against persons, but they have dealt with that one. And there's a couple others that are kind of like that, that have have already been dealt with in, in recommendations that are that have come our way that we just haven't put into bills yet. Uh, so so the, the areas, the outliers that um, I think there was concern about have uh, for the most part already been dealt with so it's helpful thanks martin Great. Thank you. uh barbara so martin would it okay. make sense sorry and then um so last question barbara and then we're going to take a break okay uh, yeah would it make sense to be making recommendations at the same time about eligible for automatic expungement it's that's all right. So one of the things that the sentencing commission was assigned to do uh, two years ago or something like that was, was expungement, looking further at expungement. Um, and, and we did and came up with, I thought really, uh, and I was on that subcommittee with a really either further complicating what expungement was. My view was, and still is, that once, and, and it probably is going to work out, is that once this structure is put in place, the whole expungement structure should be much more straightforward. You know, that, that class, different classes of crimes will have different uh, expungement eligibility, essentially. Uh, and, and it can simplify that. And I'm hoping that that's where we end up. But but unfortunately, I well, maybe not unfortunately, because we need to, in the interim, still work on expungement. And I know, I understand that the Senate yeah. is yeah, yeah, yeah. going to do that. But it should become simplified. That's the idea. And that's what I've heard from folks who have, you know, the Sentencing Commission folks. Great. Thank you. Okay, that's great. I'm going to stop us here for a break. And we do have a witness at 1015. So uh, let's take a break until 1015. Thank you, and thanks so much, Martin. Yeah, it was not as smooth as uh, what Eric would provide, but I did my best. That was great. Welcome, and uh, the uh, floor is yours. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Representative Crabb, members of the committee. I think what might make sense is for me to give a little bit of background about myself. I'm probably familiar, very familiar to a number of members of the committee, and I see that there are a number of new members of the committee too. Um, I am a Superior Court judge presently assigned to the Wyndham Criminal Division. Um, I was appointed in 2017, but prior to that, I was with the attorney, the Criminal Division of the Attorney General's Office um, from 2000 on, and among my duties was uh, testifying regarding criminal justice matters primarily in the House and Senate Judiciary Committees. So I've spent um, before my appointment, quite a lot of time um, in your committee uh, on a variety of topics, including this topic, which is um, classification of the criminal code. My apologies to Representative Lalonde for not being 
able to be present for the walkthrough. So to the extent that I cover matters that have already been addressed by other witnesses, please let me know and I can move on. Um, the act, the bill that is before you currently, um, the work related to that dates back to, I think, the 2013-2014 session when a group was created, uh, I think it was called the Criminal Code Reclassification Working Group. And uh, the members of that committee were um, David Cahill, who was then the executive director of the Department of State's Attorneys. It was before he was appointed as Windsor County State's Attorney. Uh, myself, uh, the Defender General, uh, retired Superior Court Judge uh, Walter Morris, and Robin uh, Joy from the Crime Research Group. Um, we were asked to take a look at whether um, classification of Vermont's crimes made sense. Um, Vermont is unusual, not unique, but unusual in that uh, each criminal statute has its own, generally has its own criminal penalty, uh, fine and or imprisonment associated with it. And there is no overarching classification scheme that many states have grouping felonies and misdemeanors into uh, groups based upon the potential penalty. Uh, the working group's conclusion was that it made sense to classify felonies and misdemeanors into uh, five categories, A through E for both felonies, crimes punishable by more than two years, or misdemeanors, crimes punishable by two years or less, or fine only criminal offenses. Um, ultimately, I don't remember when, a, so the next step was that the, um, uh, the legislature asked the Sentencing Commission to take a look at the question of classification. Um, at that point, um, I was a member of the Sentencing Commission, and a subcommittee was created to look at the issue of classification. The subcommittee consisted of representatives of the state's attorneys, uh, the defender generals and public defenders, uh, CRG, uh, the Center for Crime Victims Services. I'm trying to think who else was on the subcommittee. I don't recall off the top of my head. Ultimately, the subcommittee came up with a proposal for classification, which was um, substantially similar to the, um, the report that the working group developed and which was ultimately adopted by the Sentencing Commission and forwarded to the legislature and was adopted by the House slightly modified. Um, the subcommittee has continued to look at uh, basically classes of offenses since then, uh, property crimes, uh, sex crimes, uh, crimes of violence, motor vehicle offenses, Title 18 offenses, um, to uh, look at classification of those particular groups. What you have before you with the bill is the, the general classification provision, which would take um, all existing crimes and categorize them into the groups. And then a specific proposal with respect to property crimes, which is in fact the most significant change that has come out of the, uh, either the subcommittee or the sentencing commission on this point. Um, the proposal regarding property crimes would take um, basically all existing property crimes um, and assign punishment, assign penalties, imprisonment or fine based solely on the amount of loss involved or the damage, um, which is very different than the way we do things now. The, the, a very good example is that under existing law, <clears throat> um, there's a crime, a fraudulent use of a credit card if it's more than $50 involved, it's a misdemeanor. It's, it's less than $50 involved. It's a lesser misdemeanor, but that crime can also be charged as uh, false pretenses, false personation, arguably identity theft. 
And uh, all of those carry far more significant penalties, uh, irrespective of whether more or less than $50 was involved. The, the committee uh, concluded, and it was not unanimous, and the commission concluded, and it was not unanimous there either, that it made sense to propose this idea that all property crimes should be uh, treated generally equally uh, for purposes of the maximum potential punishment based on the amount of loss involved. Um, that's a significant change from Vermont law. Um, I'm happy to answer questions. I'm happy to keep going. Um, Not see any hands, but let's give folks a minute. Any, any questions? Uh, don't see any, so, so keep going, please. Thank you. Um, so the, the, the real purpose underlying this, I think, was that um, Vermont's criminal statutes lack transparency and consistency you really have to know the statute and know the penalty associated with it in order to have some idea of where it fits in um, the sort of rank of seriousness of Vermont crimes. Also, um, there, because uh, each penalty provision is enacted with the statute or updated as a part when the legislature acts to amend it, um, there are, I would say, anomalies. Um, the, the, the most, a very significant one is the distinction in uh, penalty between uh, DUI and uh, DLS, uh, driving with a suspended license. Um, the DUI is punishable by um, a fine, and this is particularly on the fine issue, a maximum fine of um, $750. Um, DLS, which I, I would suggest is a significantly less serious offense, has a maximum fine of $5,000. Um, that doesn't make, that, I mean, that, that, that appears at least incongruous in terms of um, uh, uh, how Vermont should view the relative seriousness of certain criminal offenses. Um, there are numerous crimes for which there are no fines. Um, assault and robbery um, has no fine. There are crimes which have extremely large fines. Trafficking offenses under Title 18 have a million dollar maximum fine. Um, it, th there is no, I would argue that, it, that there's no consistency across criminal offenses. The purpose here was to try to create a structure into which all criminal offenses could be placed and then um, there could be decisions um, made as to the relative seriousness of particular offenses and offenses could be moved up or down within the classification to address those issues. Thank you. Any questions there? No, I, I know there's a lot of a lot of material. <laughs> we've been yeah. doing this, we've been doing this all morning, and it's uh, um, yeah. But keep going, please. Yeah. Sorry, the, and I probably should have sent the link. The Act 61 Criminal Code Reclassification Report is still available on the CRG website and dis has some interesting information in the, the comparison between classification schemes with other states. Um, in fact, the, the model penal code classification is very similar for felonies to the proposal you have uh, before you. Great, thank you. Uh, Martin and then Kate. So thank you very much, Judge, for uh, lending some credibility to some of the things I said a little bit earlier as uh, well. Uh, so that, that, sorry to duplicate. No, 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 it, it was not. It was expanded and credible. Uh, so 
just real quickly, uh, the uh, Act 61 report I, I, I have on our website already. There's a link there, so you don't need to right. send that. Um, but I wonder if you could just give us um, a, a little uh, preview of, of some of the work that's still ongoing. Uh, and uh, we did talk, or and, and also let, if maybe you don't want to or don't need to comment on this, that the approach that we've decided to take is to get the structure in place. This bill puts the structure in place and deals with one of the categories. Mm -hmm. And and really felt, we felt, well, I felt and others felt that we need to get that out there and get this started. And then subsequently we'll start fitting those other things in that the uh, Sentencing Commission is providing. But if you give a little preview and if you could comment on how well or not well, uh, the other crime categories seem to be fitting into this categorization, that would be helpful. Sure. Um, so the proposal that came out of the um, Sentencing Commission um, did what Representative Lalonde suggested. It created the structure for everything and then um, the, 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 the hard work was reviewing individual offenses and deciding whether the, what is, we've been referring to as automatic classification, where they were sort of poured into the various category buckets uh, made sense or whether they should be moved up and down. Um, the property crimes was a complete restructuring. Um, we did uh, work with respect to um, sex offenses where uh, there's a broad range of offenses that fell within that. I don't recall if that was forwarded to the legislature or not. Um, the, there are two proposals with respect to crimes against persons. Um, uh, one primarily from the Defender General's office and the other primarily from the state's attorney's offices with um, uh, suggestions as to how offenses uh, should uh, fit into the categories. Um, there is a Title 23 uh, provision out there. There are um, concerns that have been raised, particularly in the context of the Title 23 work as to what may happen to the potential maximum fines under classification. Um, that a number, even if the sentence of imprisonment is reduced, the potential maximum fine would be increased under the scheme that is here. And just a reminder, th these are the maximums that could be imposed. <clears throat> my experience as a prosecutor and my experience as a judge has been that the maximum fine is rarely, if ever, imposed. And um, again, the vast majority of uh, criminal prosecutions that result in a conviction are pursuant to a plea agreement where there is an agreement between the parties as to what the sentence should be. Um, we've started work on what to do with Title 18 offenses. Um, there are a couple of issues out there that need to be addressed and are potentially um, complicated. One is what to do with um, recidivism, recidivism offenses, um, how to address those generally, um, and the other is what to do with penalty enhancements. Um, Vermont handles penalty enhancements basically in two different ways. Uh, one is just to increase the penalty for the particular offense. So, for example, um, a DUI one is, I think, a two-year felony. DUI three is a five-year felony. Um, there are other penalty enhancements in Vermont statute that add additional potential term of imprisonment. So if you are charged with simple assault, but that's enhanced as a simple assault on a protected professional, it's an additional one year. That's more complicated to handle in a classification scheme um, and will ultimately be an issue that the legislature, I think, will have to resolve is how generally to handle um, uh, enhancement and uh, recidivism offenses. 
Representative Lalonde, did I address all the issues that you raised? Uh, yeah, I think so. And I put in the chat uh, that Title 23 is the motor vehicle offenses and Title 18 are drug crimes. Uh, so, but no, I think so. I think so. But I guess I overall, I mean, there are there are some outliers that uh, that if I recall in the crimes against persons, there are a couple different suggestions on how to deal with certain outliers. Uh, for the most part, it seemed like there was a lot of agreement uh, with every, with the different offenses. But then there are some outliers that you just uh, talked about, and there are different proposals of how to make that work with the classification system, if, if yeah. I'm right. Yes, I think that's absolutely correct. And the two, I think, key areas that were raised were um, uh, domestic assault, which is a misdemeanor punishable by 18 months. And under the structure, there is no 18 month misdemeanor. So the question is whether that becomes a two year misdemeanor or a one year misdemeanor or something else. And there is disagreement. The, the, um, the direction to the sentencing commission was to make a proposal that did not increase proposed sentences except for a very good reason. Um, the other area where there is ongoing discussion relates to offenses that are currently punishable by a maximum term of 15 years. Again, there is no 15, under the proposal, there is no 15 year felony. There's either a 20 year or a 10 year, and there are quite a number of serious crimes, uh, both crimes against persons such as first degree aggravated domestic assault, manslaughter, and um, aggravated assault, which are uh, punishable by 15 years. There are also offenses such as DUI with fatality resulting punishable by 15 years. And the question ultimately will be if the sentencing structure is adopted with a, either with um, three, five, 10, 20 life is the felony maximums. Where do the 15 year felonies go? Do they become 10 or 20 or something else? And that's an area where um, the state's attorneys and the defender generals have uh, competing different proposals. Thank you. Uh, Kate, I see your hands up. Hi, Judge Treadwell. It's nice to meet you. I'm Kate Donnelly. I'm one of the new members on the on the committee here. Um, I appreciate your diplomacy and your testimony. You're like that doesn't make that that is incongruous <laughs> of this effort to to be diplomatic. Um, and my question, I guess, if I can figure out a way to articulate it, sort of sort of aligns with with that idea. So. In that example, you're using um, driving with a license suspended in a DUI and that the sentencing potential, I guess, I'm not sure of the language, is, is incongruous with these two things. And the first part of my question is, in, in actual behavior, do we see sentencing from judges being equally incongruous because of what is possible in terms of sentencing. And I guess the, ne the next question I have is sort of tied to that, which is I keep, Martin mentioned this, and, and I heard you mention it as well, that there seems to be a, a separation between what is allowable for sentencing and what is actually happening in terms of sentencing. And I guess it just brings up questions for me about, you know, this kind of reclassification, which sounds really important for a variety of reasons. Like it, it is it actually designed to behaviorally shift judges sentencing or is it, or is it more, more for providing more transparency and things along those lines? I guess I'm a little unclear if, if it's rare that judges actually sentence the maximum sentence, then what, what, what are we sort of doing there? <laughs> I guess I'm a little unclear on that. So I think, so those, I think are, those are excellent questions. Um, one of the things we were asked to look at at the Sentencing Commission was the actual sentences imposed by uh, judges for various offenses. And I believe CRG, I know CRG generated um, spreadsheets showing the sentences that were imposed for all crimes for which there was a conviction over a 10-year period. And those, they're a little out of date now because I think they are from 
up through 2015. Um, but, but we were asked to look at those when considering how to classify offenses. What we learned is that there is very little consistency, that there's an enormous range generally for most offenses of what can be imposed. Um, the reality is that, um, uh, the, as I said, and as you pointed out, the, the vast majority of sentences are imposed pursuant to a plea agreement. Um, uh, my role as a judge in deciding whether or not to accept a plea agreement is to determine whether I think that sentence is in the interest of justice. It may well not be the sentence that I would impose if I had, uh, if it was after trial, if it was, um, if I had the option to impose any legal sentence, but whether it is generally within the acceptable range is the question for me. Um, the proposal here does in fact potentially constrain, you know, there are proposals that we could change how sentencing works for um, uh, a significant classes of offenses. I believe there is a Title 23, a motor vehicle offense proposal out there, which might make DLS punishable by six months or less. I mean, the reality is that a, a vanishingly small number of people serve six months for a DLS. Um, the vast majority of those cases are resolved for either extremely short periods of incarceration or um, work crew, except that we aren't, as I understand it, the department is not offering work crew currently or a fine or community service as required by the statute. Um, but the statutory maximum is two years. There, there is a proposal out there that would reduce that significantly so that there would not no longer even be the possibility of imposing such a sentence. Does that answer some of the questions you have? Thank you. Thanks. I'm not seeing any other hands, so back to you, <laughs> Judge. Um, all I would say is I'm, I'm happy to come back anytime, um, uh, assuming I can squeeze it between hearings. Um, uh, this is an issue that I've worked on for uh, quite a few years. Um, and I suppose I'm here as a representative of the Sentencing Commission, not in my various other roles with respect to classification, but um, to the extent that there are committee questions related to this, either now or later, I am happy to try to answer them. Great, well, thank you so much. I, I really appreciate your work and, and seeing you and uh, thank you. Yeah, great. Well, thank you too. It's also great to be back in front of the committee. It's uh, a part of my former job that I miss, so. Right, well, thank you and I miss you, so. But good to see you in your, in your relatively new capacity. So, yes. Well, thank great. you. Okay, thank take you care. All right. Great, thanks. So, bye everyone. Great, bye. So, Martin, back to you. I know you had a few things that you thought you would still cover. Um, yeah, it's kind of interesting. The, the last uh, dialogue there with Kate, I mean, a per, uh, part of, certainly part of the intention and in, in what uh, sentencing commission members have said is that we are trying to narrow the box within which uh, judges exercise their discretion in part to address what uh, are often geographic disparities that the same crime being committed in one county versus another can result in a very different result as far as the uh, penalty. And, and by narrowing the box within which this discretion is, is exercised, presumably that will narrow those discrepancies. And, and perhaps we'll hear from other witnesses when they talk about that. I do wanna highlight, uh, I don't think I really mentioned during my presentation that there are some, you know, th there are some issues uh, even within the property crimes uh, that there was some disagreement between uh, the state's attorneys primarily and the defenders, but we'll hear from them as far as what those are. And these are the compromises that we reached last year. And, and I'm hoping that those compromises will 
stay in place this year and we can move this bill along. But, but I think we talked a little bit earlier about the other individuals we should hear from. And I, I think that, I think that we're set with that. I, I don't, I can't imagine it's going to take a long time, but. Uh, okay. Well, we, um, we weren't able to, to get anybody for, for this morning. So, um, so yeah, I'm putting the schedule together for next week and I'll do so with, with Tom and coach and uh, I think maybe give it an, like an hour or so, maybe next, next week. Please. Let me think. So if we have, it, de it depends, you know, I think, yes, an hour should be fine for uh, Marshall uh, Pepper in, in ACLU. Uh, so Marshall CRP. sometimes yeah. go, go, likes to explain things certainly and it's helpful. Um, depends on how much we want to get deeply into the CRG information. Right. Uh, that, that would possibly take a little bit longer, uh, but that depends on how deep everybody wants to dig uh, with with that. And, and I'm uh, about to send the, the spreadsheet that uh, Judge Treadwell mentioned. I'm going to send it to Mike to, to load up uh, as well. Okay, great. Okay. Uh, committee, any questions or, or comments, anything that, especially new members, that would be helpful as we work through this? It's, um, Tom. Thank you. I, I think I've said it before, but I, I just want to commend Martin again for all the work that he's done on this. I mean, this thing is, uh, potentially decades in the making. <laughs> And, and uh, just just the work that he's done to keep it moving and, uh, you know, and to, I mean, we're taking another step in the right direction today and, and uh, um, hopefully the uh, the finish line can can be in sight here within the next, within this biennium, I guess. And, uh, um, but anyway, I, I just wanted to um, Give, give him the pat on the back that he certainly deserves. So. Well, you're very kind, Tom, and, 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 and goes back to you as well that last year, uh, the, the biggest um, negotiation and compromising uh, <laughs> was actually be between Tom and I so that we could both uh, uh, support this bill. And that had to do with the felony threshold primarily. And, and it took us a while to arrive there, but we got there. Yep, that we did. Great, well, thank you, Tom, for for saying something because it is this is a really very very heavy lift but an incredibly important one um, ken you know my only concern thank you the only my concern with this whole thing is i keep going and i think back to the victims the victims like this is i, I know what, what or i believe i know what you're trying to do but it's still the victims. If you've ever had your house broken into and all that stuff, it's just, it's nothing you get over. If that's my problem. And I think I stated that last year when we were doing all this too, but. If I could just comment real quickly on that is, that, first of all, this particular bill doesn't get to the burglary of a, of a dwelling and such. I mean, it's really, uh, those those crimes of like armed robbery type that that's not part of this bill, uh, Ken. So, but I did want to mention one other thing about the property crimes that really isn't <clears throat> in this bill. Uh, it, it's just in our laws. It's present uh, the present law, and that is restitution is a big part of uh, the property crimes. That uh, part of a charge or part of the consequence is not just possibly a fine and incarceration, but the requirement to have restitution of whatever the value of the property was that was taken and such. So, so that, that is very much victims uh, centered that doesn't get part of this discussion, but I think it's important to know that that's out there. Well, I appreciate that. But so to turn it into something that is part of these, these crimes, when it happens to you, you never forget it. That's, that's all I'm going to say. Thank you, thank you, Ken. Uh, let's see, uh, Will and then Barbara. Thank you. Yeah, I, I just wanted to, and I we can I can talk about it at more length later in the committee process if need be. 
but you know, I, I do just want to want to touch on uh, the this conversation we just had because you know one of the things that on that is in here is, is retail theft, and you know I manage a bookstore, and books are very easy to to slip in your pocket, and we we lose a, a decent amount of um, stock over the course of a year. Once we a year we do inventory, we adjust. Um, you know we have floor plans in the store designed to um, best enable um, our clerks to keep an eye on the, the higher theft items. Um, but at the end of the day, um, what it comes down to for me is this, it's uh, there'll be times where you know, someone's in the store and maybe don't pay attention to him or her because there's other customers and something goes missing. Um, it's very obvious. Uh, we, lose out of, we lose out of tarot kits, for example, or um, Danforth jewelry. And you know, you would think, okay, um, it was probably that person who who was wandering around and waiting for an opportunity. And you know, when I when I when I think about the people who who do this, and and for some of it, it's of course conjecture. I don't know them, but you know, I don't think that this is a, you know, they don't look like a gang of of thieves who are striking. It looks like someone who really wants something uh, that they can't afford, and it, someone who really feels the need for something. That they, that they don't have the money in the pocket in their pocket to get. And, you know, I want these people to be held accountable. I want these people to make restitution um, for, for their transgressions, but I don't see where um, extended um, incarceration achieves that goal. I don't see where that helps them at all. And it certainly, in the end of the day, doesn't help me. So, you know, I'm looking at this as something that can make our laws fairer on both ends. And quite frankly, if someone is committing, in this case, retail theft, sure, I want them to be accountable. I want them to, um, I want them to uh, have to think about what they've done, and and also put them on the path where they might not be as tempted to do it again. And and there are services available um, that I would like to see utilized, and I think someone can do restitution, but also get the help that perhaps they need um, for various things, financial insecurity, so on and so forth, to get to a better place. And I don't see where an extended or any incarceration for that matter it is something that, that helps the process either on my end or on theirs. So so when I look at this, yeah, I can, I can think of this uh, from a victim's eyes, sure. But I, I think we need to make certain that we're not talking about uh, some form of revenge, and we're talking about a system that, that fairly uh, treats everyone involved on both sides. Because I think that um, the vast majority of people, in at least in my store's instances, um, if they were more financially secure, they wouldn't be doing this. So, so I do think that we need a system that correctly reflects on the challenges that everyone is facing. Thank you. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, Barbara, you had your hand up, right? Yeah. So I also, I think this is a really good discussion that actually Ken raised and um, appreciate what Will just said also. We heard a few years ago from, for those of us that were on the committee for, I think it was three, I don't know. I don't think it was last session where um, Representative Donovan had somebody from Macy's and Outdoor Gear Exchange come in. And it sounds like there are these businesses that like we heard they were taking out like 60 North Face jackets and, you know, I mean, very different than what Will was describing. Um, and our current laws weren't really covering that crime. But um, I, any crime that we make a felony is gonna lit, no matter what we do pretty much, unless we have automatic expungement um, or expungement is gonna live with the perpetrator forever and um, not gonna make their life better. So in addition to Will raising the point about incarceration, um, which costs us all financially, as well as in terms of the recidivism rate, the felony um, collateral consequences are so big for people in terms of going out of state, in terms of getting 
um, a federal loan and living in subsidized housing that I would love for us to really be as discerning as possible as who we put in a felony category. And just the other piece I want to say is um, I've been to some restorative justice um, events where the victims of the crime want some acknowledgement and you know, in some cases they had a loved one killed or they were scared. And the unbelievable view that they take about um, not making somebody else's life miserable for something that's not gonna change their situation was just remarkable. And I don't know if I would have grace in that situation, I hope I would, but um, it just made me realize how important restorative justice is and um, right, revenge or just, I hope we can look away from engaging in that. Great, no, thank you. Appreciate that. Martin, did you want to respond to that at all or? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, I did. I, so though it's not really so involved in this particular bill uh, and it, it was a little bit of our discussion last week as far as uh, what the Judiciary Committee does. I mean, we didn't, we haven't really gotten into what the criminal justice system is uh, supposed to accomplish. And, and one of the, one of the uh, reasons for incarceration is punishment. It, it is retribution. There's, uh, and, and uh, so, I mean, where Kenneth's coming from is, uh, is actually, you know, historically is one of the purposes uh, for, for a criminal justice system. Uh, having said that, I mean, we are moving more towards uh, wanting uh, restorative justice practices, rehabilitation. Uh, deterrence has in the past been thought of as one of the rationales, but uh, studies upon studies show that, uh, that penalties really don't have a deterrence effect or minimal. Uh, but, but, you know, the, I, I, do, I do recognize uh, what Ken might be talking about as far as retribution being something that that is part of uh, of the criminal justice system, and, and we can't overlook and just ignore that. Even though we're trying to go into more of a restorative process, but not everybody chooses to want to go into restorative uh, the restorative process because, as as Barbara says, they don't have uh, necessarily grace. And and uh, I mean, I so anyway, I, I just. It's, it's a legitimate uh, viewpoint to say that people don't forget these kind of uh, crimes. However, having said that, that really is more in the realm of crimes of uh, violence and crimes of you know, sex. I mean, uh, that these property crimes don't involve that as much, uh, so. Right. And certainly as we move forward, we, um, we will invite victims advocates um, you know, for some, for input on these bills. Okay, any, anybody else? Okay, so we, we are ahead of schedule, which is always a nice thing. Uh, after the Florida Day, we'll hear about an update on H20 and uh, I'm hoping we can, we can wrap that up. And then uh, tomorrow morning at Nine, we're going to um, hopefully wrap up um, H18, and I'm hoping that there will be a, an agreement there. I know that um, that the AG's office, Attorney General's office, and um, Legislative Council have all been working together on that, so so we can move that along. Um, so I guess I will um, adjourn us for the morning, and we have some extra time to <laughs> do what we we need to do. So. Thank you.